So one of the biggest pushbacks I get on this channel is talk about, Matt, how can you mix money and faith? They don't go together. Matt, you're gonna go to hell, Matt. It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man going to heaven, and money is evil. So in this episode, I'm going to unpack the real reason money is the root of all evil and what you need to know about it because in my opinion, money is just simply a tool. We're gonna to dive into wisdom by King Solomon. Proverbs chapter 21 of the Wealth and Wisdom series here right now on the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel starting in three, two, one, let's go. What's cracking everybody? Money smart guy, Matt Zapali here. Hey Liam to you from Dallas, Texas. And uh, if you haven't done so already, and uh, you feel like you've watched a couple of our videos already, please consider hitting like. And if you watch a couple of our videos and you've gotten value, you've dropped comments, you've taken some notes, please consider hitting subscribe. Okay, let's get into it. Timothy 6, verse 10, it reads like this. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. For some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So with that being said, it's not a secret that money is extremely extremely important for you to get the next financial level of your life, to have the access to education and quality of life that you strive for your family. Well, Matt, is there always going to be poor people? Matt, we need to help the poor people. Well, the Bible also says that there are always going to be poor people. And I've often said, there's different types of poor. There's obviously the condition of poor, the financially poor, and the financially successful, but also there's also the condition of the spirit, the heart, the mind, because there's also a difference between being broke and being poor. See, broke is a temporary financial situation. You can get in this situation, you also can get out of it. But poor is accepting that you'll never be something great, that you'll never be financially free and financially successful, that you'll never get out of the rut and the pit that you're in from an economic standpoint. And so 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, in my opinion, is one of the most misunderstood and abused and manipulative scriptures that a lot of people in the faith, love to share and cast on guilt to other people that want to strive from a financial and economic standpoint and improve the quality of life of their business, their employees, their staff, and most of all, the people that they love and care about and their family. So in this episode, I'm gonna go over things that King Solomon had mentioned about the impacts of money and how millionaires and leaders go about understanding that there's a difference between right and wrong and using money, power, prosperity, and wealth to not benefit yourself right here on earth, but to overall magnify and glorify the kingdom of God. So let's get into it. You know, John Maxwell is a reference Bible that I use oftentimes, and uh, he's got some great insights here and from the lens of leadership, his insight into how these Proverbs come out from the perspective, again, of a leader. And he tells about money, who's in charge? See, oftentimes people get money twisted. People think that money is in charge, your boss is in charge, you as a business owner, that you're in charge, I'm the entrepreneur, it's myself. Me, myself, and I, I'm an entrepreneur. I am an entrepreneur. I have my own business. I have my own company. I, 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 I. We get wrapped up in who is in charge versus actually who's in control. Because from a faith-based perspective, it comes from the understanding that we are created for something greater than ourselves, for a purpose greater than just ourselves. And I don't care who you pray to and whatever their names are, but from a faith-based perspective, you understand that the creator the person who created you, they're in control. You're just in charge. You're in charge as a steward. You're in charge of somebody that inherited money. You're in charge of somebody that inherited an opportunity. You're somebody that came across something, you stumbled across some money, you came across a conversation that changed your life. You are now in charge of what to do with that opportunity. Whether it be five bucks, 10 bucks, a thousand bucks, a million bucks, you're in charge of that opportunity. Now, you're also submitting to the fact that a power greater than yourself is in control. So let's take a look at what King Solomon, who's considered the wisest and richest king who ever lived. For 40 years, he led the Hebrew people through an area in a period of prosperity. And so when he was writing these Proverbs, these sayings, there's always differences. So from a millionaire lens, a leadership lens, there's a difference between right and wrong. Let's take a look at what King Solomon here said in Proverbs chapter 21. Now I encourage you to read Proverbs chapter 21 yourself. I've got about 10 of them right here, but there's over 31 verses in Proverbs chapter 21. I've got only 10 of them, so don't depend on me to read Proverbs chapter 21 for you. Don't depend on a pastor or a teacher or a leader or somebody that you hold in high esteem in your life to read them what you need to be reading and studying yourself. Just allow me then to just introduce you to some things that I've been thinking about and how I perceive this, because at the same time too as well, I could be wrong. Why? Because I'm a man. 
I'm flawed, and many of you know all my mistakes. I got a lot of mistakes. I've often said my entire 30s were paid the mistakes in my 20s. I've had a lot of mistakes that I've documented well on, on, on this YouTube channel. And again, let's, talk, let's take a look at what King Solomon here has to say about laziness and overindulgence and pride. Well, oftentimes people say, do you, man, do you. I'm just gonna do me, okay? But is that a good thing? Proverbs chapter 21, verse two, it reads like this. A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. So who's weighing your decisions? Is it just me, myself, and I from my own finite human experience? Or am I tapping into a wisdom that's infinite, that has experienced a lot of other things that people have done right and wrong? Or are you tapping into counselors that can help you make a decision? So therefore you can do a better version of you in anything that you set your sights on. Number two, haughty eyes. What do you mean haughty eyes? Proud heart. By the way, let's define what haughty means. Haughty is defined as arrogantly superior and disdainful. So eyes that look arrogant and an arrogance of a proud heart, is that good? Because sometimes you say, I'm a CEO. I'm a millionaire. I'm a VP. I'm a boss. I'm in charge of this neighborhood. I got my own car. I got my own business. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 21, verse four. It reads like this. Haughty eyes and a proud heart. The unplowed field of the wicked produce sin. So not only proud, it's also lazy. It's unplowed. The work ain't done yet. And that, therefore, my friends, is sin. Because the work ain't got done yet, but yet you're proud of what? You ain't done no work. What are you proud for? What are you arrogant for? Number three, get rich quick at all costs. What? Because some people today, Think that, man, no, no matter what, I'm going to get rich quick. I'm going to cut corners. I want hacks. I want to get rich quick. I want to try to rise above this inflation thing and rise above rising gas prices. I want to cut corners, steal and rob mentally or physically or financially. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 6, it reads like this. A fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a deadly snare. Even King Solomon is warning you, don't get caught up. Pick the right wife. What? Pick the right wife. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9 and 19, they read like this. Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. 19. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. Now, somebody said, well, are wives all naggy? Well, by the way, ladies, this is some insight to you. And by the way, ladies, you're probably watching this. You're probably, Matt, you're such an a-hole, blah, 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 blah. Listen, guys, we got our own mistakes too as well. There's many scriptures that we'll be revealing here on these Bible studies on Sunday nights that talk about the arrogance of man, the haughtiness of man, the laziness of man, the pride of man. Listen, there's very many different things that are wrong with men, but scripture talks about nagging and quarrelsome. And so I was just recently on a podcast with Adam Sosnick. He hosts a show called Sauce Money. And we did, talked about the difference between a powerful man with a powerful woman or somebody that just is gonna go and go gangbusters and knock themselves out and have 10 girlfriends and five girlfriends and follow the Nick Cannon route. And by the way, what do you feel is right for those of you watching the Seven Figure Squad? And I'm quoting you from King Solomon of the Bible who wrote Proverbs, all this wisdom I'm quoting, and he had six, seven hundred wives and three, four hundred concubines, thousand opportunities there, I guess, whatever you want to call it, and thousands of kids. What do you think is right? One wife? One woman? An honorable man? Honorable husband? Honorable wife? Wife of noble character? Or many options. I'm curious what you have to say. What an area of conflict. I'll put it in the comment section below. Strength from the path of prudence. What is prudence, Matt? What is prudence? Let's define prudence. Is defined as this. Prudence is defined as one word as cautiousness. Simple as that. Cautiousness. Are you cautious about the decisions that you're making? Now, there's a big difference between cautious and procrastinating. Because oftentimes people say, well, you know, Matt, I'm going to pray on it. Oh, you know, Matt, I'm just going to sleep on it. No, no, that's procrastinating. You should have been already praying. You should have already been looking for an opportunity. Now you got to do something about it. I get cautiousness. Okay, then ask yourself what's the worst that can happen with making a decision. The cautiousness, straying away from the path of cautiousness, the path of prudence. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 16, it reads like this. Whoever strays from the path of prudence comes to rest in the company of the dead. Go ahead and make a hasty decision. And then, yeah, did I make the right decision? Proverbs talks about that too as well. You make a decision and you go back and wonder, did I make the right decision? How many of you right now have clothes in your closet and you still have tags on them because you think about returning them? See, that's straying away from the path of prudence. And the Bible, some of you buy homes and cars in the very same way. So I'm not trying to bag on the ladies because dudes, we make some of the worst decisions too as well with finances. 
We buy this video game, we buy this car, we buy this edition, buy this accessory, and go back and try to justify it with the wife, and it disrupts whatever game plan financially that you got going on. Okay, so what should you be doing? What does King Solomon say in Proverbs chapter 21 about diligence and putting the right type of work? Which effort leads to profit? Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5, it reads like this. The plans of the diligent lead to profit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. So you got to go about and be diligent in your work. Okay, so let me explain what diligent means. What is it defined as? Diligence is careful and persistent work or effort. Are you careful and persistent with your efforts to build a business, to climb the corporate ladder? Are you careful and persistent about increasing your financial literacy? Are you careful and persistent about seeking out what God has, your creator has in mind for you as it relates to your success and wealth, prosperity, and financial well-being? Number two, love pleasure. Love pleasure in wine? Love pleasure wine in oil? Is that good? Now, who doesn't love a glass of wine? Who doesn't love a drink? By the way, I'm an investor in drink. I'm an investor in a company called Uncle Nearest. But what does it say here in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 17 about those things? Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. Now, here's the thing too as well. So why did he create it? Why did God create liquor and wine, pleasure? It's the overindulgence of it. Too much pleasure, too much overindulgence Overindulgence hurts you. It's a sin. It causes you to stumble. And some people say, well, then you shouldn't have it to begin with. Some more conservative perspectives of application of this scripture, of this proverb, says, you know what? If it's going to cause me to stumble anyway, it's going to cause me an overindulgence. I'm going to stay away from this pleasure. Well, here's the thing too as well. You're married. Don't you like to have sex? Is sex not pleasurable? So that means stay away from it? Well, an overindulgence of this could potentially be wrong if it's just one-sided. And you're forcing yourself because you want pleasure, but your wife or husband doesn't want it. So therefore, you got to come together and not just have sex, but have deeper intimacy in your relationship. As I believe your creator wants deeper intimacy with you about the decisions you're making in your life with your finances, your success, and your walk here and experience here on earth. The wise store of food, though. Check this out, though. Here's a, here's a paradox. Love, pleasure, wine, and oil are good, but also says in another scripture, wise store up food, oil, and provisions. Let's read it. What it says in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20, reads like this. The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulped theirs down. You know, there's a big difference between people that take an opportunity to look at scripture. Fine line between those who are successful and not successful. Fine line between right and wrong. You know what that is? It's fine line. It's layered with habits and diligence and choices. Right there, that's that fine line. You want, you want to walk that fine line between right and wrong, the fine line between wine and pleasure and storing of food and oil, even though these things might be working against you, that fine line is what you do with it, how you apply it. The fine line is the habits. Do they serve you, do they don't serve you? Your choices, do they serve you for the long term or only for the short term? That's that fine line. What does uh, King Solomon here say about one that is wise? Do you want to be wise? Well, there's some power behind this. What type of power? Let's look at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 22. It reads like this. One who is wise can go up against the city of the mighty and pull down the stronghold in which they trust. Listen, there's some craziness going on in America today. Some craziness. Just last week, they reported that since this is Pride Month, right here in Dallas, there's a bunch of drag queens having a party, and they invited parents along with their kids to join the party. So there's a lot of strong things that's happening in America today. A lot of things that go against your core beliefs and attitudes and behaviors. It just doesn't feel right with you. That, that doesn't feel right, that feels wrong, correct? There's a lot of indecisions with parents and indecision with finances and raising their children and building their families. A lot of indecision happening today, but you can go against all those things if you seek wisdom, if you go wise. Because you strike down the things that are mightily holding people in a stronghold. You can strike down the things that have imprisoned people and put them in shackles mentally and spiritually and financially if you walk and are wise. So when you're going about your life, you're going about your decisions, am I asking myself, am I being wise about this decision? Or are I just being too hasty and emotional? Big deal here, especially what's going on today. One who is wise can go up against a mighty city, especially if that mighty city is going about things wrong. You can be that type of person. Last but not least, number five. Example of what not to do and what not to be like. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 25 to 27, 
three verses here. It goes like this. The craving of a sluggard will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. All day long he craves for more, but the righteous give without sparing. The sacrifice of the wicked is detestable. How much more so when bought with evil intent? Whew, a lot to unpack there, a lot to study, a lot to pray about. And when you're reading this line by line, verbatim, also look at what is obvious and what is not obvious. Ask yourself when you're reading the scriptures, ask yourself, what is King Solomon, what is God, your creator, trying to tell you about how to go about life, how to go about with the righteous way, the wrong way, understand that you are in charge of your decisions, but who ultimately in control is your creator who loves you from up above. So with that being said, guys, love your thoughts, your questions, your ideas, your feedback. You agree with me? You don't agree with me? Put it in the comment section below. And my hope there is that you take these scriptures and you play offense. You play offense with what you know in your heart and process it here through these scriptures. Now, it's not going to be, a, okay, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that right away. It's going to change overnight. But I promise you, if you work at these things over a period of time, an extended period of time, you'll gain experience how to make better choices about right and wrong. You make better choices about who you put in your life. You make better choices about how you go about laziness and haughtiness and overindulgence and pleasure and all these confusing things that may seem so paradoxical about you making a decisive decision to change your life. I hope and pray that you swallow these things and you consume these things and you process these things and you pray about these things because you are bound to be something great, to do something great with your career, do something great with your finances, do something great with your family, do something great with your business. All I know is you were created to do something special and great in your life. If you believe that, put it in the comment section below. I am designed to do something great with my life. I am designed to do something great with my life. If you believe that, you affirm that, put it in the comment section below. So before I let you go, please check out these other Proverbs that we've broken down in previous weeks. 52 weeks of us doing this right now. We're in the 21st week. Next week will be Proverbs chapter 22. That being said, if you found value in this video, please consider a like and put your best takeaway, biggest takeaway in the comment section below. If you watch a couple of our videos and you haven't done so already, please consider hitting subscribe. So thanks for joining us. From Dallas, Texas, I'm your money smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.